Okay, great. Welcome. Good. Good to see you all this evening. And um, today I am continue oh, continuing um, by looking at the sayings of Jesus. And I mentioned before each of the one I've done before about a preacher who said he'd been reading the red and he'd been really encouraged by it. what he meant by reading the red was a red letter Bible. You can get Bibles where the words of Jesus are it printed in red. And so that's what we're we're doing at the moment. And, um, you know, when we look at the words of Jesus, the whole of the Bible is equally inspired. But when we look at the sayings of Jesus, the things that he said, uh, they're as fresh today as the first time he said them. And also, um, they're extremely challenging, extremely challenging. Um, and so I think it's good for us to spend time meditating on the words Jesus spoke during his ministry here on earth. And today I've chosen a very challenging saying of Jesus, and I've taken it, taken it out of the Sermon on the Mount. And my title for this um, short talk is a, Dis a Discipleship PhD, a Discipleship PhD. You know, there's different levels of discipleship. And the most important thing is, is that you are moving forward in your deepening discipleship walk with the Lord. It's not all or nothing. It's not you're either everything or nothing. It's a question of what direction are you going in, in your discipleship, in your following Jesus? Are you going forward or backwards? That That's what matters. I say that because when I'm looking at discipleship PhD, I don't want anybody to look to look at the words or hear what I've said and think, oh, I'm just going to give up. I'll never get there. Um, you're not there. I'm not there. But we're heading towards it. You know, it's true that um, uh, if you shoot for this, if you aim for the stars or shoot for the stars, uh, you, you might make the moon. And if you aim for the moon, you might make the clouds. But if you aim for the clouds, you'll never make the moon and you'll never make the stars. So it's important for us to see that Jesus, he 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 he, he doesn't mince his words. He knows we're on a journey and we know he's so graceful. Look what he did to Peter when um, uh, Peter denied him, having cut off somebody's ear in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, he didn't dismiss him. He knew he was on a journey. So we're all on a journey. But let's let's have a look at aiming for the stars a little bit today, because um, Jesus uh, uh, always, um, you know, gave the best, gave the best of what we could become, even if we're on a journey to become it. All right. So having said that, here we go. Matthew 5, verse 38 to 48, a discipleship PhD. In other words, what I think is the the ultimate in reaching Christian discipleship. It's not a GCSE, it's not an A-level, it's not 11 plus, it's not a degree, it's not a master's, it's a PhD. What would someone walking in PhD levels of um, Christian discipleship look like? Matthew 5 verse 38 to 48, um, part of the um, Sermon on the Mount. Here we go. Retaliation. <laughs> Excuse me. You have heard it said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? For if you love those 
uh, do not do not even have the t do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you only greet, if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. I'll just leave that up for a few a few moments. Now, this is in the Sermon on the Mount, and the Sermon on the Mount is the greatest sermon ever preached. And I can't preach on all of the Sermon on the Mount, but just a quick context here for when you read things in the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is the blueprint for the Holy Spirit to build discipleship in your life, okay? The Sermon on the Mount is the blueprint for the Holy Spirit to build discipleship in your life. So if you want to know what a hope, what a spirit filled disciple is like, read the Sermon on the Mount. That is a spirit filled disciple. Uh, right at the beginning, you know, the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. It's a picture of a spirit filled disciple. Uh, why do I say a spirit filled disciple? Because you can't do this without the help of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount um, is not legalistic. It is uh, to be applied in your life and through your life with the help and guidance of the Holy Spirit and by trust and faith in your father. So one of the major aspects of the Sermon on the Mount is the help of the Holy Spirit, because you can't do it without the Holy Spirit. You'll become legalistic or you just become discouraged and disappoint, disappointed and you won't move in the direction of the spirit filled believer that is described uh, in act and deed and word in the Sermon on the Mount. So you need the Holy Spirit, but also you, you need to have faith in the Father. So one of the big um, parts of the Sermon on the Mount is um, what you do in secret. Your father will reward you openly. And so this is about walking in life, trusting and believing the father and putting your trust in him uh, even more than circumstantial events. All right. So with uh, so with that, when we come to to these sayings here um, at first, it looks absolutely ridiculous loving your enemies um turning your cheek when someone slaps you giving your cloak to somebody who asks for your shirt going an extra mile for somebody who forces you um to to go to go um a, a mile um the, these 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 words in themselves um can seem impractical self-destructive even like you're being asked to be a, a a doormat that you just do what everybody wants you to do. You could even even take it to extreme and say it's almost like saying let somebody abuse you. They can hit you and you turn them the 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 the, the other cheek. But that's a misunderstanding of what we're reading. I am not in any way going to take away the cutting edge. Well, I hope I don't of these words. Um, but they do need to be put in context. The Sermon of the Mount is full of principles, not laws, principles. And so when you see these examples of being slapped on the right cheek um, and turning the left, when you see an example of not resisting who's evil, when you see an example of um, someone asking for a shirt, you give him your cloak. When you see an example of someone ask you to go a mile or go with him two miles or one who wants to borrow or begs from you. And you see these are examples. These are the sort of attitudes and responses in these given situations that the Holy Spirit may lead, lead someone to do. OK, it's a picture of a type of person. That doesn't mean that you just stand there being slapped on your left, on your right, on your left, on your right, on your left, on your right. If someone attacked me, um, I think I would have, I would um, defend myself. Also, the slapping in its context is one of um, an, an, an insult, an insult. 
but it's the type of openness that when someone would slap you on the cheek, you you would not take offence. You might deal with offence, but you would not take offence. You would not allow somebody slapping you to to then um, then uh, uh, what's the word? To then ensure that you respond in kind. Okay. So if someone slaps you on the right, if someone slapped me, if someone slapped you, how would you feel? Okay, you have to work through those feelings. But the person who is a spirit-filled Christian in the Sermon on the Mount would be in a PhD level of discipleship and would be able to process that and take the slap and take the insult to the Lord and then not slap back, not slap back, but remain open to reconciliation forgiveness love it would not be an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth we've got to get away uh from this old testament you did this to me so i'm going to do that to you uh you slapped me i slapped you tit for tat that's not new testament ways the reason that we do tit for tat if you slap me i'll slap you um uh, if you ask me to go an extra mile, that's taking advantage of me and I won't do it. It's self-protection. It's self-protection. And I'm not against self-protection. But what 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 um, the Sermon on Mount is saying is that actually your first thought is not that you will protect yourself, but your father will protect yourself. And so the idea being is that you don't give as good as you get but you're different. You're different. You don't strike back. What you do is you take these things to your father in heaven, right? Now you might say, well, Bruce, if someone slapped you tomorrow, what would you do? I don't know. I don't hold a PhD in discipleship. I might instinctively slap them back. And if I did, I'd be wrong to do that. Or if someone was nasty to me or made a nasty comment to me, that I'd be nasty. I hope I wouldn't actually. I hope I've grown, but I wouldn't give, you know, be nasty to them. If someone texted me nastiness, I hope I wouldn't immediately text them back nastiness. Do you see it's it's this type of 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 principle? If someone somebody wanted something for me, uh, I hope I wouldn't be the sort of person that if somebody wanted my shirt, I hope I'm the sort of person that would think, well, could I give them a shirt? Could I afford to buy them a new shirt? In fact, could I not only give them my shirt or a newer shirt, um, could I could I get them a coat as well? See, the principle, it's not that every time somebody asks you for a shirt or a blouse that you have to give it to them. That's a law. It's not a principle. But the sort of person, the sort of person that we're going to become is the sort of person that would say, well, can I give this person my shirt? What's stopping me? I can get another or believe the father will provide for me. And, and maybe I can't just give them a shirt. They need a shirt. They're not just being silly or, you know, they need a shirt. And they're asking for a coat. Maybe, I mean, maybe I can give them a coat. Maybe I can double bless them. So can you begin? To, I hope, well, I hope you see it's the principle. It's the kind of person behind these actions. It's not that we have that these are new laws. Therefore, every time someone asks you for a shirt or a blouse, you must give it to them and their coat and ask no questions about why they're asking it or what their needs are. It is it is the law of the Sermon on the Mount. It's not that at all. It's not that at all. There may be times when someone comes and asks me for a shirt and I'll say, no, I actually need this shirt because I'm preaching in it. And I notice that you've got plenty of clothes. You know, I might say that. Or I might feel prompted by the Holy Spirit or generosity to think, do you know what? I can, you, you like my shirt. You really like it. Let me uh, let me see what I can do and see if I can find one for them. And if I've got the money, I may not have the money to do it. But if I've got the, maybe, the money, maybe I could bless them with it. Can you see it's not an exact law, but I'm thinking already. I'm thinking about the principle behind it, aren't I? And then and then I can apply that to other things. You know, where perhaps generosity, when somebody admires something or, or would like something or needs something that I won't immediately just say no. But I'll think, 
what would the person what would this sort of person do in such a situation and then i have to say think two things holy spirit what do you think i should do i'm under no compulsion but holy spirit what do you think i should do in this situation remember what i said you can only apply the principles of the holy spirit sorry the principles of the sermon on the mount which is the blueprint for the Holy Spirit building character in your life, you can only apply these things with the help of the Holy Spirit in any given situation. Because you, two people in the same situation, the Holy Spirit could lead to do two different things. Okay? It's the principle applied by the Holy Spirit. So you say, what would this type of person do? Well, they're certainly open and generous. Holy Spirit, what shall I do in this particular situation? Lead me, help me, what, what shall I do? And then you'll find that as we grow, we might make mistakes, but as we grow, we'll become more like the person that is described in the Sermon on the Mount, which is a mature, spirit-filled um, person, all right? So I hope you get that. It's the principle, it's the, the type of attitude that somebody does not... Give an eye an eye for a tooth for a tooth. So if you're ever wanting, you're in a situation with somebody where you want to give as good as you got, you know, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, then I, I would say you've really got to stop for a second and ask yourself, is this the sort of person that we've just read about in the Sermon on the Mount? Gives as good as they get, an eye for an eye, a slap for a slap. Um, is this the sort of person? Is that what you're doing in this situation? Are you doing an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? Are you self-protecting yourself and and um, and hitting back? Maybe you've got to pause for a moment and think about the type of person that's being described here in the Sermon on the Mount and think, Holy Spirit, what shall I do right here? What shall I do right here? So you look at the principles that describe a spirit filled person in the Sermon on the Mount. You say, Holy Spirit, what shall I do in this situation? If you, you know, if you can, if you've got time to do it, you know, or to reflect. Reflect. What does this situation, what would be? And, and you'll make mistakes and you'll do better. But this is the whole point. It's a growth thing. So what are the principles? What sort of person? do i read about here in and how can that affect me as a person in this situation i find myself holy spirit help me what shall i do in this particular scenario and then thirdly where am i going to have to trust the father in going forward here that he will protect me he will watch over me and he won't make sure that ultimately i am taken advantage of okay Right now, I just like to go to the the pinnacle of this, the pinnacle of this, which is loving your enemies. So we've got this. We've got these basic. Don't hit back. Be generous. Uh, ask yourself, what type of person is this? And if you have time, meditate on this passage and think, what sort of person would this be like? What would this mean for me? And then when a situation comes, you say, what shall I do in this situation? What, what sort of things might this spirit filled person do as an example? And Holy Spirit, what do you think I should I should do? And then we get love your enemies. Uh, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemies. Well, that's um, that's easy for us. That's easy for us because it's easy to love somebody who loves you. Respect somebody who respects you. Be generous to someone who's generous to you to be forgiving to someone who's forgiving to you. But it's another story to love somebody that hates you, be generous to someone who's been stingy to you, um, to be kind to somebody who's rude to you. Um, and but Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. And he gives, you see, here comes the father, I said, I'm going over it because I'm trying to drill it into you in a short time. I've said the Sermon on the Mount are principles that they describe a spirit filled Christian and the types of things that a 
spirit filled Christian may do in an, any given situation as a model and example. They're not laws. Secondly, we need to ask the Holy Spirit to help us in any situation. What shall I do here, Lord? Give me wisdom. Holy Spirit, you know, help me see what shall I do? I, I want to be like this person in the Sermon on the Mount. I'm not legalistic, but I just want to know what what's what shall I do in this situation? And then thirdly, the father, the father. I'm going to have to lean and trust the father. Where am I going to need the father to step in here supernaturally? Um, if I'm not going to protect myself, then I need to go to the father for his protection. And so here is the example. Sons of your father who's heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. They call this, just for your interest theologically, common grace, common grace. There's two types of grace, common grace and special grace, okay? Common grace is the grace that God gives to the whole of creation, the whole of, well, specifically the whole, well, the whole creation, but specifically the whole of humanity. So God does not um, judge all unbelievers immediately so there are people that hate god curse god follow false religions and yet they have food and yet their 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 vegetables grow and and yet that that there are blessings in their life even though they don't recognize them and thank god for it you know that there's water in their taps there's heating for them so every, everything that that is a, we would call a blessing and we would thank god for that, that comes to human beings, um, whether they hate God or love God. This is called common grace. It's common to all. It's common to all. So the very breath that an atheist mocks God with is common grace because God's given him the breath and another moment to live. Every moment a non-Christian loves uh, lives is common grace. So it's the it's that which is is a blessing if i can use that way for the whole of mankind whether they're christian or not and so the example for us here is that that the father is uh making the sun rise on the evil and the good you know there may have been a time when i would have just wanted to uh, uh make the sun rise on the good there may be times when i've thought of bad people or enemies and I want God to um, sort them out, not bless them. Um, I, I don't; they don't deserve blessing, Lord. Um, look at how they've treated me. Look at how this person is speaking about you and working against your kingdom. They don't deserve anything, Lord. Don't you know? Uh, curse them, or um, or uh, um, or make it terrible for them. And my and the Father in heaven says, uh, "Hello, um, it's me that they hate more than you." And it's me that's the judge. And if it wasn't for me, you would hate me. Uh, me, you would hate me too. And so this is a sort of picture of him sending blessing to the just and the unjust, despite, despite the fact that if you are not saved, you are, the Romans declares, an enemy of God, an enemy of God. When you weren't a Christian, don't think... That, that God, you know, when you weren't a non-Christian and at times you might just think, oh, well, God, thank you for this. God, thank you for that. But you didn't even know who God was. Or if you didn't even believe in God, God was still blessing you, even though you were his enemy. When good things happen to enemies of God, it, it, it's it's God that does it. All right. It's God that does it. And so it's like the, the Lord saying, you know, if I'm good, if I'm good to enemies, uh, then you should be good to enemies. This is the example, because if you just do what the tax collectors and the Gentiles do, which is when someone's nice to you, you're nice to them back. And when someone's good to you, you're good to them back. You know, it's a little bit like eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But now if someone does good, you'll do good back. If someone loves you, you'll love them back. If someone blesses you, you'll bless them back. If someone curses you, you'll curse them back. You know, this type of tit for tat. But then if someone's good, but he's saying we, we got it, we've got to move into we've got to grow and move into a different di dimension and be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. 
Now, that word it isn't actually perfect. It's mature. The word is teleos, mature. To be mature as your heavenly father is mature. He's not asking you to be perfect, 100%. It's that you would be mature like your heavenly father is mature. That's why I've called this little talk um, Discipleship PhD. Because for me, I think this is the the epitome of um, walking in 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 um, in discipleship. These these issues, and just to help you as a uh, the reason that we can begin to love our enemies and open ourselves to loving our enemies is when we realize that the our enemies have no real power over us. Our enemies have no real power over us why is that that's because our father is in control of everything and everybody including our enemies all of the time god is totally control of everything and everybody including our enemies all of our time now this belief uh requires growing levels of trust in the father now jesus believed this totally about his father he understood, for example, that no one could harm him until his hour had come. And then it would only be by the father's permission. And because he knew that nothing could happen to him without his father's will, that's how he could love all people. He, even those committing to crucifying him, they didn't even know that they were cooperating with the father's plan. Remember Joseph, he's a good one. Joseph, whose brother sold him into slavery and they meant to do him harm. But uh, God meant to do it good. And Joseph came to understood this. And that's why it made it easy to forgive him, because they had literally meant him harm. I mean, they were nearly going to kill him. And then they saw they meant him harm. They did. It was they, it was a horrible thing. He didn't excuse that. But he said, you meant harm for me. But but God meant it for good. And so when he met them, he had no bitterness. Imagine that he was Pharaoh's right hand man. He could have destroyed them straight away. But he loved his enemies because he knew that they couldn't ultimately harm him. He didn't fear that he was under their hand or their control or that or because this is the problem with enemies. You think that they're trying to control or destroy you and you sort of think I've got to preserve myself. I've got to I've got to fight back or else they're going to take it. Um, f f um, from me, they're going to frustrate my goal. I remember one, one, one enemy that I had. I didn't want the person to be at my enemy. I didn't do anything to cause this person to be my enemy. But this person um, grew in jealousy uh, regarding myself and my gifting, and um, it got stronger and stronger until it was. Quite, in, I felt it quite intolerable, the way that um, this person was acting, um, saying things about me, and working behind the scenes. It was intolerable. Tolerable. It really was horrible. And I said, "Well, well what am I going to do? How do I apply this love your enemies to this particular person?" And and I realized that the only way I could handle even beginning to love love him and bless him and pray for him was to pray about it, to pray about it. Because I could have fought flesh with flesh. I, 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 I could have used political methods. I could have briefed other people. I could have gone and, um, what's the word, uh, uh, made myself a victim and told everybody how horrible he was. I only had two or three people who were my confidence that I would share this with and I felt a bit freer with them but I could have done a lot of briefing I could have done a lot of things to fight back with what was what was happening but I I, I knew I had to grow in this area and I'm not saying I was perfect in this but it certainly was a leap in learning and growth so I prayed and I prayed and when I was frustrated and when I was just so angry I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed to the Lord that God that and I wasn't praying for him to begin with. I was praying that the Lord would sort this out. I was praying that he would micromanage this. I was praying 
that none of the things that this person obviously wanted would come to pass at my expense. And if it did, that it would be part of God's bigger plan. And I prayed and I prayed, you see, because I couldn't deal with it on my own. I knew what the spirit filled Christian sort of attitude would be from the Sermon on the Mount. Um, so I had the blueprint. I knew that the Holy Spirit would want me to be to be loving because it says love your enemies, bless them and not to not to fight back and try and try and destroy them, which I could have done. So I knew that. But how do I do it? And and the only way I could find was by praying it through again and again and again and again. I'm praying that God would be so in control that I could trust that that my destiny was not in this person's hands to pray enough that I knew that this person could not rob me of God's future. And I had to keep bringing it to the Lord sometimes two or three times a day, because inside you have this self-preservation, this fear that this person is saying things about you, doing things against you, trying to bring you down. And you have to take it again to the Lord and you have to take it again to the Lord. But there's times you get breakthrough and you, you've prayed. I said, Lord, I've prayed about it. This person cannot stop your will for my life. And therefore I'm going to bring kindness. Now, there were times that I, I did speak to that person and even confront them because this isn't about being a doormat. OK, it's not about being a doormat. But there were times when I spoke to this person, when I confronted this person. But I can honestly say when I spoke to them and confronted them, it was coming out of this <coughs> sort of like this isn't I got to the place where I thought this isn't going to be good for him in the future. You see, I was beginning to change. So I was getting to the place of confidence in God, but I had to confront him because it would be ungodly not to confront him, you know. Beyond, so sat down, spoke to him on a number of occasions, said, look, this, this, why is this happening? We need, you know, this isn't good. But it was in a spirit of reconciliation, a spirit that was growingly wanting the best for him, thinking that I am got to the place where I actually thought I'm going to be all right. I'm going to be all right. I was growing in confidence, still niggled me, angered me, still had to take things to the Lord on a daily basis. Still had to say, your will be done, not his, your will be done, not mine, your will be done in this situation. Your plans will not be, will, will not be um, taken. Um, even if it appears that he wins, Lord, I trust you because I have prayed this through. So that's how I was processing it. Yeah. But I got to the place where I grew a little bit, my discipleship, where I had confidence in God. I got increasing confidence in God. And um, and then I was thinking, if this person doesn't change, it's going to go bad for them. Not just with not not perhaps with me. I'm not there. I'm not. I refuse to be be his enemy, but it's going to go bad for him with other people. Because if he thinks this is how it works, um, then, then there's going to be a problem. Well, in in the end, I was thoroughly vindicated. Sometimes you're not. OK, but in this particular case, I was thoroughly vindicated, not by myself. God has other ways of dealing with people. And I was thoroughly vindicated without vindicating myself. But at the same way as being thoroughly vindicated, the person eventually came round and um, we'd become friends. He, could, he, know, he knows, he knows that if I need him, I'm there. He knows that. We're not, we're not having chats and going out for coffees and stuff like that. If he wanted to, I would, I haven't got a problem anymore. He doesn't have a problem. And, and he actually sort of like, you know, in, in, in the only way he could, what said to me a number of years afterwards, um, uh, that he'd watched how I'd had he hadn't understood at the time, but he thought about how I handled it and he really appreciated it. OK, it doesn't always work like that, but often it will because God likes to encourage us. So I didn't do it perfectly. I am not a discipleship PhD holder. I'm just sharing some thoughts with you tonight on how you can move forward step by step in these things. It's not all or nothing. But even a slight change in the way you deal with things that come to you is moving forward. God bless you. Thank you, Doreen. <music>